A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. God also hath set the one over against the other, to the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is, a, it is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Who ple whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a, a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. So we're continuing now in our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. We're up and through to the end of seven by the time we finish out the sermon today. Today I'm talking about wisdom and faith. Wisdom and faith. At the end of chapter six, we began to see Solomon here identifying the benefit of riches that are put to use, the benefit of, of riches and wealth and gain that is enjoyed by the one that earns them, by the one that works for them, by the one that toils and labors for them. It is a great benefit to the heart and to the soul of the one that does so. He also then, in the beginning of chapter 7, identifies different virtues that are gained by things not pleasing to the flesh. In order, in other words, it's not just the riches and the wealth and the possessions that are to be enjoyed. It's even the hard things that don't feel so good to the flesh that are to be enjoyed and to be gained from. There is gain to have both in abounding and both being abased, both to have much and to suffer need. And the Apostle Paul reiterates that same premise in the New Testament. These better things then, though they're not pleasing to the flesh, are better for the soul, better for something that is 
everlasting, something that goes on. For all this world and the things of it are going to be burned out, melted with a fervent heat. So it is better then to grow spiritually and to be strengthened in your soul than to have great wealth and riches and just leave them to the next or have them to be burned up and, and turn to dust in the end. In verse 11, and that's where we're going to get started on, is in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, as we've already studied down through the book of 10, or to the 10th verse there, talking about better things. Verse 11 starts to get on the idea of wisdom and how it relates to all that's been discussed. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, it says in verse 11. Wisdom is good with an inheritance. And by it there is profit to them that see the sun. So if there is to be then an inheritance, if there is to be gain, if there is to be growth, it is better that it would be coupled with the wisdom to bear it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, a few uh, chapters back, and in verse 18 it says, Yea, I hated all my labor. Remember that this was a time in, in uh, uh, Solomon's life when he began to seek after all the things that the world desires. And in the end he said of it all that it's vanity and vexation of the spirit. And there is no profit to it under the sun, though he thought to please himself, though he thought to gain and, and enjoy mirth by wine, though he, he sought to have great works before him that he would gain even peculiar treasures and grow in possessions. And he sought after that, that dream that most men have, to have the riches and the wealth and the, and the fame even among men. And at this time, he looked back in verse 18, after he had done this great experiment, he said, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. So back in the context of Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 11, he's explaining that the inheritance is good, but it must be coupled with wisdom. Otherwise, the one that leaves it has this great turmoil and toil within their heart, though most likely they're dead and passed on. He realized that he was going to leave it, not knowing whether the person after him was going to be a righteous man, a wise man, a good man, was going to do great things with it. He figured that it would more likely that he would be a fool and would just spend it. Either way, it was vanity to him. He hated his labor because he had put so much into it and then he couldn't take it with him. This was the realization that he was coming to. He would have to leave it to another and who knoweth what type of man he would be. So then with that inheritance, wisdom is good. Wisdom is good when it's coupled with the inheritance. Verse 12, it says this. It says, for wisdom is a defense and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life unto them that have it. So if they lack in wisdom, then the money, though it is a defense, can often just be, be, be spent and be wasted. Inheritance need to be received, and sometimes they are received unexpectedly. There's a death. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a amount of money or an inheritance that just comes upon a person at, at an unexpected moment. And quite often that can be something that, that destroys or that is destructive. If you were to look over in Proverbs chapter 20, you'll find a few passages dealing with this. Keep your finger in Ecclesiastes 7 and go to Proverbs chapter 20 if you will. Quite often an inheritance can do a few things. If it's a hardworking man that receives the inheritance, it can make him into a sluggard. If he's a fool that receives an inheritance, he can be made wise in his own conceits, corrupt in his own mind, puffed up. And that's the next point, is that pride often takes over the person that receives of an unexpected inheritance. It takes over their heart and they get this sense of self-worth, this sense that they're somehow better. They haven't labored for what they have, they haven't worked for what they have, but money does crazy things to people. If you were to look in Proverbs chapter 20, and in verse 21, the Bible says, An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. So when you receive that inheritance hastily, it arrives in the beginning, and it comes to you in a swarm, and you just have this great inheritance, often the end is not blessed. The end of the matter, in other words, the end of the person that receives of it and is not wise with it, 
will be destroyed because of it. The end of them will be actually less blessed than they were in the beginning. And it's hard for us to think about that. If you were, if you were very poor or maybe just middle class, you get a whole bunch of money. The Bible here is saying that the end of that is not blessed unless you're wise with it. If you're, if, you're, if you're instructed and you receive of the wisdom that goes with that inheritance, 99.9% .9 of people will be ruined by it. I know a guy in uh, Ingersoll when I was growing up, and he owned the bowling alley, and the guy won the big lottery twice in his life. Literally twice in his life he won the great big lottery. His bowling alley to this day is run down, and he went bankrupt twice. He won the big jackpot twice, went bankrupt twice. That is a fool. That, 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 guy, that guy is not wise. That There's something wrong with somebody that can win that twice. The odds of that are... Who even, like, nothing, right? I mean, it's, it's so rare, and yet he had that cup on. You would think he would have been wise by the second time that came upon him. But no, he spent it, he wasted it twice. On the flip side, sometimes we see that inheritance coming. That's when somebody sees their, their family member who is very wealthy, and they may be set to pass. And they know that all the wealth and all the riches are going to come to them. And the flip side of that, not receiving it hasty and the end not being blessed, is that if you were looking at Proverbs chapter 28, the inheritance that is afar off, Proverbs 28, and in verse 20 it says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Verse 22 says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. So the evil eye is always associated with covetousness. It's the eye that's always seeking something more. Something that doesn't belong to the person is the evil, the harmful eye. And here, the inheritance is sought after to be speedily. You're seeing the inheritance, you're seeing that dollar sign in the future. You just can't wait for Mima or Grandma or Grandpa to pass away so you can receive of that inheritance. And now you can see why that would be considered an evil eye. It's, it's covetousness that actually comes at the expense of somebody else. You're hoping to receive of that. That's the flip side. Either you get the inheritance speedily and unexpectedly, and it destroys somebody that once was good and makes the latter end of them worse, or the flip side is that you see the inheritance coming and it causes that great covetousness. And I don't know if many are aware, but covetousness is a sin that will get somebody thrown out of a church. God considers that such a big deal because covetousness is infectious. So that person with the evil eye is constantly dwelling upon wanting more, upon wanting more, upon wanting more. And every conversation that they have is just tainted by that same desire to gain and to grow, and to gain and to grow. And that's actually infectious to people and something that should be put out of the church as such so that it doesn't grow, it doesn't accumulate, it doesn't multiply. So that sense of self-worth, that entitlement, that pride, is a problem with both types of inheritance. Wisdom always needs to be there to restrain that hasty spirit. That hasty spirit that either receives of the inheritance and immediately goes out and spends it and wastes it to the point where that end is worse than the beginning. Or the hasty spirit that is desiring to get a hold of it, waiting for that day, coveting after that day. Wisdom needs to restrain that hasty spirit. Wisdom will put the right goals and right focus into the inheritance as it's on its way or as it's arrived very quickly. The possessions that are received, they will be used to benefit others. They'll be used to grow in wisdom and to grow in things that are have longevity. They will not be something that is spent and wasted. A, wi a wise person that receives an inheritance understands the woe that Solomon was experiencing when he says, who shall I leave this to, the wise or the fool? The wise person recognizes that that was not your labor and you need to treat it as such. You didn't work for that. That is a gift that fell upon your lap and you need to treat that gift with the proper respect and the person that worked for it with the proper respect all in the same. So if you're to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and read verse 12, you see the Bible says wisdom is a defense. Ecclesiastes 7, 12. <laughs> wisdom is a defense and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life unto them that have it. And so this is another one of those very interesting verses that, that uh, just like at the end of Mark when it says, He's that, He that believeth and is baptized hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not is condemned. I'm, I'm misquoting that. But what it did is it, it just negated the fact that baptism had any part of the salvation. Right? Because 
it said, he that believeth and is baptized, but he that believeth not shall not. So it's, it's giving all the onus of the salvation to believing. And baptism is just like a secondary or a tertiary item that is attached to the statement that is being made. In the same way, this statement says wisdom is a defense. Money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life unto them that have it. You see how that statement is giving onus unto the wisdom first as being the defense and money being a secondary or a tertiary item. The excellency of the understanding is that wisdom as the defense is the safeguard, is the protection. Money in the same way is a defense, is a safeguard, is a protection if it's cover, if it's coupled with the wisdom. If those two go together, then money is the defense as well. It is the safeguard. It is the protection if it's coupled with wisdom. Why? Because it's wisdom that is the excellency of knowledge. It is wisdom that giveth life unto those that have it. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, the Bible says in Proverbs. Wisdom is the principal thing. It is the primary focus. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Money on its own then, while it is a defense, what is it a defense of? Quite often, money on its own without wisdom is a defense of our pride. It's a defense of our ego. It's a defense of our self-image. It's a defense of our riotous lifestyle that we take that money and apply it to. And you see this all the time. Fools get a bunch of money and they live that riotous lifestyle. And you'll see an example of this in Luke chapter 15. Again, put your finger in Ecclesiastes 7. We'll go to Luke chapter 15. And this happens all the time. People get a ton of money, just like my bowling alley friend in Ingersoll. He got a ton of money. He went and bought a car. He went and bought a house. He went and bought a bunch of stupid things on credit, mind you. And before he knew it, he was bogged down in all of the wealth that he had. He had dug himself so deep in the debt that even the winnings he had in the first place could not compensate for the deep ditch that he had dug by his own stupid and foolish decisions. He became rich, and he was a fool, he was not wise, and therefore he wasted it all. Then he became rich again, and he was foolish and did the exact same thing twice. I can't even imagine. Now with regard to the inheritance gotten hastily, and how that applies to what should have been restrained by wisdom, we look at the story of the prodigal son. He's a great example of this, living out. In Luke chapter 15, in verse 11, the Bible reads, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. So that one's the second group, right? That one's the one that sees the inheritance afar off and has that hasty spirit that desires to have it. Here he doesn't desire that his dad dies, but he might as well. He's basically saying to his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have your money. Dad, can we, can we speed this along a little bit? Just, just give me the portion of my inheritance now. And to a dad, to a father, that is basically saying, I, I, I wish you were dead. Because all that's important to me is the money that you have and that it comes to me as soon as possible. But the father did, lovingly to his son, divided unto them his living. That's the two brothers here. And in verse 13 it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, so he wasn't a wise one, was he? When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks of the, that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. And I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So we see then that wisdom would have removed that desire for him to not want to be rich. He would have subdued that spirit to desire more, to desire what his father had, to be covetous towards what his father had. 
Wisdom also would have, when it took of that inheritance that it reserved, would have stayed put and not run away. Wisdom would have taken, just as the older brother did, and embraced that thing. you got to wonder how much wisdom might have been gained above and beyond when instead of taking what his father had given him, and not many days after, took his journey into a far country, if he would have stayed with the wise man who had gathered all this wealth by his labor, and if the younger son would have just learned something from his dad. That, in my opinion, would have been the wise thing to do. Instead, he took of it all, and instead of going to proceed in the same fashion that his dad did to gain that wealth, instead of going into the same works that his dad did, instead of learning something from his dad about how to even gain such wealth, he goes and he takes it, and he wasted all of the substance with riotous living to the point where in the end he was joined himself to, not his dad, but a citizen of just any country that he happened to be in, and finds himself in the fields feeding swine. Wisdom also wouldn't have wasted by riot. It would have not taken that gain and lived at large. It wouldn't have had that varied lifestyle, that amusement, that, that violent uproar, which is all descriptive of what a riot means. It's completely uncontrolled. It's relentless. It's, it's just constantly seeking after destruction. And that's the lifestyle that he went and he lived with his inheritance that he received. That lifestyle destroyed him. And it will destroy you, and it will destroy anyone who is not wise and receives of an inheritance and hastily spends it or hastily seeks after that inheritance that is one day to come. The one wise thing that the man did here was that he recognized that he still had his father. And when he was in the muck, and when he was in the filth, and when he was in the lowest of the low, and his situation couldn't have gotten any worse he was fain to have filled his belly with the waste, the stuff that the swine didn't want to eat. He came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? I will arise and go to my father. He makes that statement. Father, make me as one of thy hired servants. And in humility, he comes back. But how much better would it have been for him to have received that inheritance with wisdom and done right things with it instead of having to learn the lesson that we're now learning from Ecclesiastes. This is why I, I love the writings of Solomon because he did the exact same thing as the prodigal son. He went and he just ruined his life at the latter end. But now he's writing to warn people, hey, I had it all. I did it all. I enjoyed of it all for a time, but sin had a lifespan, and when it ended, it was just waste, it was just vanity, it was just vexation of spirit. Ecclesiastes 7, in verse 13, says, Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? We ought to all do this. Consider the working of God. How he makes it, so shall it be. How he purposes it, that's how it will go. God does give man free will, but he always has this way of imposing his own will into any situation. Consider the work of God. If he's going to make it straight, you're not going to make it crooked. If he has a plan for you, you're not going to deviate from that. And I think of Jonah at this time. Jonah was told to go and preach in the Nineveh, and he went in the opposite direction. Next thing you know, he's swallowed by a fish. He goes through this turmoil, the Bible says, in hell. He experienced the, the depths the, of the world. He just, the bottom of the mountains was where he finally came to himself as the prodigal son and realized that he had sinned against God. God finally vomited, used the fish to vomit him up onto dry land. And he ended up going and preaching unto Nineveh, one of the shortest passages you'll find in the Bible, that did God's purpose in the end, even though he was reluctant, even though he was unwilling in the beginning. Consider the work of God. If God's in a work, if God's moving in a work, and it's a straight work, you are not going to make it crooked. If it's a crooked work, you are not going to make it straight. His purposes will always be fulfilled, if that's what he so desires to do. Verse 14 says this, In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. God also hath set the one over against the other, to the end that men should find nothing after him. So the end of all of these circumstances, and what you see here is that he says this, he says, in the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. And then he makes a statement, he says, God has set the one over against another. So here is the work of God. He takes your 
prosperity and he takes your adversity and he sets them one over against another. They almost seem to overlap. And his purpose is that you would rejoice when you're pros prosperous. You would consider when you're at adversity. But he goes and he puts them together. So what would a wise man do in this situation? A wise man would rejoice and consider always. Just put them together. If God is going to take by his work in your life, and he is going to take your prosperity and just knit it together with your adversity that you're facing, and you're always going to experience these one over another as they interweb and as they align one with another. He's trying to teach you by the wisdom here that we ought to rejoice and we ought to consider at all times. Just like at any time you're going to be feeling prosperity and adversity at the same time, you need to do the same and always be considered by wisdom to be rejoicing and considering and moving in your life in that particular fashion and in that way. The purpose then of all of this is that you would realize that there is nothing after God. That's what he says at the end. He says, to the end that man should find nothing after him. So he sees what, here's what happens generally in our life is we'll have a prosperous time and we'll have a time of adversity. In the time of prosperity, we just want to rejoice. We don't want to think about God. We just want to do our own thing. We want to be happy. We want to be going about our own business. But as soon as adversity enters in, usually people start to go, Oh, God, help me. I need help at this time. I need guidance at this time. And seek after God. Well, his purpose in taking both those situations in the Christian's life more predominantly and putting them together is that man should find nothing after him. Man should find the end of all purposes are God himself. And so whether you are blessed and rejoicing, or whether you're in adversity and suffering need, you need to be seeking after God and understanding that the end of all the purposes, the end of the work of God, is Him. You need to seek after Him. God is the end of all things, especially for the Christian, especially for the believer. Verse 15 says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in wickedness. And a verse like this explains that famous question you hear so often from unbelievers as they'll say, well, why does God let good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? And they think that raising some sort of anomaly like that, that somebody who is righteous before God is going to have bad things happen to them, and someone that's really wicked and, and forward is always succeeding, they think that bringing that anomaly before you will just have you go, oh, you're right, God must not be good. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible teaches that God sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, the circumstances and the situations and the, and the ideas or the things that go on in our lives, just as rain just falleth on everybody. In other words, God isn't up there, I believe, manipulating every single event and every single story and every single item in somebody's life at all times. Just as a rain, so do good things and bad things come into people's lives. Whether you're righteous or whether you're wicked, you're all going to experience the same rain. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11 puts it this way. He says, I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Things happen. And that's the explanation that's happening. Things happen. Time and chance. They may seem random. They may seem un, uncharacteristic of how you would expect that God would behave. But that's the plain truth is that these things are just happening unto men. Just as rain falls upon somebody. So when you look at a verse like 15 and you say, you know, all things have I seen, there is the righteous man that perish. There is the wicked man that has a prolonged life. Some of that is simply because uh, God's will isn't necessarily imposing himself on these situations. But life, but time, but chance is happening as things go on. Now, I believe God is all-powerful, and He is without, without everything in control, if He will be. But God, we also have to 
uh, pair that up with the idea that God has given free will. And some people cannot comprehend that either. Well, if God is so good, why wouldn't he just make everybody born again? Because our God is not a dictator. And if he just forced everybody to be saved, he would, it would be an unloving thing. We'd be saying the exact opposite. Why are you forcing me to love you? Why are you forcing me to go to heaven? What if I don't want to? God has never run his way in this world whereby men do not have the institution of free will where they can choose. It's just like when we go out there, we present the gospel to people. And we can sometimes fumble and bumble and not really get it forward very well. And someone says no, or someone says yes. It's their choice. Sometimes we nail the gospel presentation. It's crystal clear they get it. They still have the faculties by the grace of God to say yes or to say no to the gift that is set before them. God isn't over everything, imposing his will upon absolutely everything. Sometimes rain falls on the righteous. Sometimes it falls on the wicked. We have to understand that we're all going to get wet at some point, whether we're righteous or we're wicked. We can't always, and this is what people sometimes do, Christians will. Uh, they'll, they'll mess up and rain will fall on them and they'll be like, oh, God's mad at me. Or, or, or they'll be doing something well and rain will fall and they'll be like, what did I do wrong? And, and, and their life just becomes this series of signs. And Pentecostals are huge into this, where they're constantly just like, every moment of their life, well, should I do this? Should I do that? They're always looking for a sign. They're always trying to lay that fleece down and hope that God will tell them what house to buy. God will tell them where they're going to live, what car to buy, what they're going to drive, where they're going to go to school. He's just going to guide them in every aspect of their life. No, God gives you free will to choose and to decide. And when you make a decision and then rain falls on you, it's not because your decision is wrong. It's just because sometimes rain falls on you. We need to stop guiding everything based upon the reactions of this world because Death and chance, light, or time and chance happeneth to us all. Rain falls on the just and on the unjust. It's just a general dropping sometimes. And sometimes it's also just a matter of perspective. We might think something's really bad in our life, but God's using it together for good. And that's the end of the unrighteous people. We need to understand when we see the wicked prospering, we can't be like Asaph who looked at it and was ready to give up on God because he saw the wicked people prevailing and the wicked people having a great life and the wicked people being blessed by God. The end of that person is death and hell. And so sometimes God is blessing somebody as a means of 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 judging them in this life. That's why the rich get richer, the wicked get wickeder. God is just giving them over to do whatsoever they will. And if they want nothing to do with God, he wants nothing to do with them. If they're just going to constantly be a front to him and going in the wrong direction, he's okay to just let them do that. And it's a judgment. It's just a picture of the judgment to come. Their best life is now. You know, Joel Osteen was right. Your best life now, right? That is his best life right now. He can have his plane. He can have his mansion. He can have his throngs of people worshiping him. This is his best life. Because what's to come is hellfire because he has not believed on Jesus Christ. So we can't look at that situation then that Joel Osteen has and be like, you know, I, uh, I wish I had that or covet after that thing. We need to understand that what we have is what we have. We're blessed by it and rejoice in it and consider while we're going through it. Verse 15 says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. We just read this. Verse 16, if we continue on, says, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? And so this is kind of bringing back the situation as if that somebody had lots of money, somebody had lots of inheritance, that they're not just going to inherit maybe the wealth that is attributed to it, but they're going to inherit some of their responsibility. And so here in verse 16 and verse 17, uh, Solomon starts to deal with the responsibility that comes with inheriting a great wealth, the responsibility that comes that if you're wise, you're going to embrace and you're going to behave rightly in it. He says in verse 16, be not righteous over much. In other words, don't be doing right over much. Don't have much things that you're doing right by. Neither make, thy, make thyself over wise. Why shouldst thou destroy thyself? So being too righteous, being busy and becoming a wise person can actually destroy you. Why? Because you're, stri- you're spreading yourself too thin. There's only so much good that someone can do. The Bible says don't become weary in well-doing. And some of us do have that tendency. Let's say somebody inherits a bunch of money, and then they just go about trying to be as good as they can. And being righteous over much, and being wise over much, and spending rightly, and eventually they just burn themselves out. Why shouldst thou destroy thyself? 
But then it says here also, be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before the time? And the other thing that can happen is you're over much wicked. In other words, you have a whole bunch of money and you start to become an enabler of all those people that are around you that, that you know, giving them this and they're going to go to something wicked with that. Giving them that and they're going to go to something wicked with it. The biggest problem with receiving a big inheritance sometime is the fact that suddenly you have all these friends that you you've long since forgotten, right? Everyone's showing up at your door looking for handouts. And so you can be righteous over much and destroy yourself because you're just giving and giving and giving in righteous causes. But you can also be over wicked, enabling fools to continue on their foolishness and being foolish like them and dying before your time, wearing yourself out by just constantly uh, laying your hands on, blessing, encouraging the wicked to do wickedly, right? Uh, one example, you know, the, the, the homeless person comes up to you and they're like, hey man, I need some food. And you say, um, by doing righteously, right, being over much righteous, you would say, hey, I'll buy you a sandwich. And then the next guy, you're buying a sandwich. And the next guy, you're buying a sandwich. The next guy, you're buying a sandwich. And then constantly, you're just kind of wearing yourself out in that activity. The other thing that will happen is that same homeless man will come and he'll say, no thanks in the sandwich, just give me the money. Well, now you're giving the money, you're giving the money. You don't know if he's taking it for drugs or for alcohol or for what. You would be then over much wicked. You would be foolish just as they were enabling that same behavior. We need to be wise in these kinds of things. And I, know, I don't know that anyone's in a situation where they're going to inherit much. But the things that we inherit aren't necessarily wealth. They're not necessarily lands. They're not necessarily um, something of monetary value. Sometimes we just inherit responsibility. If we get a promotion at our job, if we get, you know, suddenly we have people under us instead of being at the bottom of the rung. How about this? Children. Children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. We have inherited those children from God Almighty. He's given us the responsibility to oversee them. In the same way, when we take on that inheritance, there's some wisdom here that we can, we can seek from this, and you're to get the inheritance with wisdom. You know, be, be prepared for the work. Be ready for the work. Do the right thing with the responsibility, the children, the wealth, whatsoever it is that you're inheriting by a gift. You're supposed to do right with it. Not being righteous over much. Not being foolish over much. But understanding what your job is, what you're to do, who you're to lead, what you're to... you got to be able to break all this down and by wisdom do the right thing. Verse 18 says, it's good that thou shouldst take hold of this. He's encouraging the fact because right now the book of Ecclesiastes, I believe he was writing to his son. He was explaining to his son the things to come. And by, by extension, he's also encouraging us in the same thing. And he says to us, almost reaching out of the pages of the Bible, the word of God says, it is good that thou shouldst take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Take hold of this. Take hold of the word as it's being preached. Um, fear God. Have him in reverence above all things. Have him elevated above all things. Fear God and keep his commandments. We're going to learn at the end of the book is the whole duty of man. And part of being uh, under God, part of being in the fear of God, is that you would also accept the responsibility that it has for you while you're in this world and would take it seriously. The one that does take hold of this responsibility, the one that does fear God appropriately, shall come forth of them all. In other words, there is them all, and they come forth of them. You're going to be better than your peers, spiritually speaking, if you take hold of the wisdom that is being taught here in the Bible, and is specifically in this passage, and you use it for the right purposes. You apply wisdom, you apply understanding to the principles that you're hearing. There's more exhortation to wisdom down in verse 19. It says, Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We, we mentioned earlier Proverbs 4 verse 7. It says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. Here we see that wisdom strengtheneth. Wisdom gives strength to those that have it. More than ten mighty men. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And quite often we use that verse when we're explaining the gospel. If you would make them understand that they're all sinners. But notice, not all, notice it, it's again bringing the fact that wisdom strengtheneth. But we need to take note of the fact that all are sinners. Therefore, being wise doesn't necessarily navigate you entirely beyond the point where carnality can take control. What he's saying here is that wisdom will give you great strength, but don't forget that you're a sinner. Wisdom will give you great um, 
great methods, great ways of using your wealth, using your inheritance, doing the busy. Don't forget that you're a sinner. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There, there's, there's wisdom in practically applying it to your inheritance. There's also wisdom to understand that you can't rely upon your own wisdom. And that's when we come to the full circle of this lesson is the fact that, that wisdom has to be coupled with faith because there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So even if you are a wise man, you are prone to falling. You are prone to failing. You are prone to having a slip up whereby you allow your carnal mind and your carnal heart to take control of any situation. You're not free of these tendencies. Verse 21 says, Also take no heed to all the words that are spoken, lest thou hearest thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed thee. Others. Again, another reminder not to get caught up in hearing everything that's going on. Remembering that you yourself behave in the same way. And sometimes when we become a leader, when we become somebody that's overseeing a family, we become somebody that's overseeing at a job situation, we start to have our ears open to everything that's going on. We need to focus on ourselves. Don't worry about what the world's saying because the, the reality is, is that even as you may catch something that you think might be someone cursing you, your own heart has done the same thing. Again, pointing back to verse 20, there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So here Solomon, within the context of this scripture passage, he outflows great and deep truths, but he brings it back to remind us that you're still flesh. He gives you these great truths about how to spiritually manage an inheritance when it's received and how to do righteously by it, but he reminds you, hey, you're still flesh. Verse 23, he says, All this have I proved by wisdom. I have proved all these things by wisdom. I have, I have expounded all these things of, of, in wisdom. And he says this, he said, I will, I said, I will be wise. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise. But look at the next phrase. But it was far from me. He set himself forth to prove these things by wisdom. He said in his heart that he would be one that was seen as wise. He would live a wise life that would, he would do wise things, but he recognized it was far from me. In other words, the wisdom is far beyond me. I cannot be over wise. And this, is be, this is from the man that was the wisest man who ever lived upon earth. And he is recognizing, like it says in verse 24, that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? There's a gap in our own wisdom. We're never going to be wise enough that we can completely navigate this life without our carnal tendencies grabbing hold of us. Solomon said this also. He said that with much wisdom is much grief. He said, as knowledge increaseth, so increaseth sorrow. So there is an end to wisdom. There is a max. You peak out at some point where you have you have enough wisdom whereby you can just fail at life. <laughs> you have just enough wisdom whereby you can navigate certain situations, but you're always going to fall short of the glory of God. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Where our flesh fails, we need to understand that faith is the victory. Where our flesh falls short, we need to understand that faith steps in. So even still, Solomon, though he sought out, like it says in verse 25, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even foolishness and madness. And though he thought he could know, he could search, he could seek out wisdom, he understand that there was a shortness in his own self that he couldn't get away from. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And so he himself needed faith to fill that gap. Verse 26 says, I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands, who pleaseth, whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. It seems here in his old age, it seems here as he's reflecting, that he found, almost in a venting sense, he's saying, I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands. He's almost, he's almost just speaking in his heart. Remember, at this time, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, right? And, and all of those wives from different nations had turned his heart 
from the Lord. And he sought after strange gods to appease them. He built temples to these strange gods to appease them. You know, you got to think, uh, men, you have one wife, and it's, it's a lot of work to keep her happy, right? Imagine having a thousand women that you have to try to keep happy. The man was spread too thin. He was over much righteousness, right? He, he was also, though, by default, he was over much wickedness. He made himself a fool because of it, because in his attempt and his zeal to do good by his wives, he also gave them the opportunity to seek after strange gods and to seek after false gods in the worship. He failed in the area of faith. He's recognizing now as he looks back that, you know, it almost just, it's just this, this statement that he makes. I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. You know, he loved these women the best he could. He, he, he married these women, and, and, and as he knew them, he did try to do good by them. But it's almost like he's just making this statement out of, out of disappointment in himself, that he was taken in the snares. He was bound within, within their desires and succeeded them. But then he says this, he says, Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Just the confession here that he's making. If he had turned from pleasing God, he had turned from faith. I mean, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And he did not jump into the area of faith, but in his carnal self, he thought that with the great wealth, with the great fortune, with the great notoriety that he had, with the fame and fortune, he could overcome all the obstacles that uh, come from inheriting wife upon wife upon wife upon wife. And in his own pride, he fell. And now in reflection, we see Solomon finds himself, even names himself indirectly here, as the sinner that was taken by her. Just a generalization of the women that had stolen his heart from God and he was as he was turned unto idols. Verse 27, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. So in verse 27 he talks about he f counted one by one to find out the account, to find out the way of things. Like it says in verse 25, to find out wisdom, to search, to seek out, to understand, to, to know wickedness, to folly. He went on this great search to understand the ways of all things and what did it do to him? It ruined him. God hath generally made things upright and his understanding and his method of understanding going one by one by one, he proved that he couldn't undo what God had made. Like it says in verse 13, consider the work of God for who can make that straight, which he hath made crooked. And that's exactly what he found was that man was generally made upright, but they have sought out many inventions. And how often do we as believers, God will make one thing happen in our life. God will have one purpose for us in our lives. And we seek out many inventions to deviate from God's plan, to do our own thing, to impose our own will upon the ways of God. We need to be wise. When God gives you an inheritance of a calling, when he gives you an inheritance of, of the blessing of salvation, when he gives you the inheritance of a family to oversee. When he gives you those things that you inherit, you need to be wise with what you do to them. Otherwise, you're going to be found to be pushing against, to be kicking against his purpose and his plan. And if God made your life straight, you can't make it crooked. If God made your life crooked, you cannot make it straight. You need to be in his will and according to his will, follow after whatever he has for you in that moment. And you're not going to do this in the realm of your own wisdom. Because God likes to take somebody that is wise and understanding of their own situation and knows how to navigate every aspect of their lives, as Solomon did, right? He was, as we read in Ecclesiastes, in complete control of his destiny. He left the kingdom. He left the castle. And in doing so, he went to the bottom. He worked really hard. He proved himself with mirth. He had great possessions, and it was all through the toil and the labor of his own hands. He brought himself up to a point where he probably thought in his own mind that he had made it and he was self-sufficient and he could do it. And now I'm in a position that I, I could have a thousand wives and things would be just fine. I could go outside. He was wise in his own conceit and it brought him to ruin because his wisdom reached a point where he could not completely control the carnal mind, the carnal flesh. That, and he didn't realize until after 
that would eventually be his ruin, his carnality. And so when that happened, what he needed to fill that gap where his wisdom could not suffice, it could not prove enough, could not constrain enough the carnality of his own flesh, he needed faith to step in. And this is what Christians need to understand is you're not as wise as you think you are. God here encourages wisdom, but take advice from the writings of Ecclesiastes. Take the advice from a man that was a self-made gazillionaire, the richest man upon the face of the earth, sought after by the whole world, living in a time of peace where everyone loved him, everyone rejoiced over him, the women flocked to him. He seemingly had everything that a man would desire, and in reflection of it all, he says, hey, I lost track of the fact that there's a bitterness, there's death, in the woman whose heart is snares and her hands is bands. It didn't even have to be a particular woman. It's just a generalization he's saying that he was taken down by carnality. He was taken down by the flesh because he did not heed to the fact that the works of God are straight. He can't make them crooked. The works of God are crooked. He can't make them straight. He thought that he could, by his inventions, maintain his lifestyle. He could get away with it, but here we have a bitter man at the end of his life expounding in you to you, hey, be wise, but have faith. Be wise, but have faith. Don't turn your back on God, because when he turned his back on God, he was not acting in faith. When he stopped pleasing God, it was because he did not have the faith to trust God in these situations. But God charges us, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And I think as, as the, the proverbist here starts to explain that wisdom is good with the inheritance, when you're given a challenge, when you're given a charge, when you're given a responsibility from God, it's good to have wisdom, but you need to continue pleasing God. You need to continue to have the faith to follow God because if you start relying upon yourself, do not be surprised when you're the sinner that is taken away by something carnal, by, by the woman here was his downfall, right? The woman took him down. But for us, what can it be? Well, it could be the job. It could be the, it could be the career. It could be the, the motivation for sports. It could be anything. You name it. If you have something that is pulling on you carnally, that has every potential to be your destruction. And you are not wise enough to stop it from doing so. Trust God. Follow God. Continue pleasing God. And how do you please God? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him.